uh, militia today, Maccabees, they rose up and they said, you know what, we, we can't stand for this. We've got to do something. And so they, they fought against the Greco-Romans and kicked them out of the temple and kicked them out of the immediate re region uh, there in Jerusalem, uh, which was miracle number one. Uh, and then when they got in there, they decided that they were going to rededicate the temple. We're going to have it a place of worship, a place of offering to our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and so uh, to do that, they had to have consecrated oil, but they found only one vial where the seal wasn't broken. And so they knew that was the only oil that they had uh, to reconsecrate, rededicate the temple. Mm -hmm. And that oil had to burn for eight days for the cleansing of the temple. Uh, they said, well, we'll start with what we have. This is only enough for one day. We'll start with that. But miraculously, miracle number two was that oil that was only enough for one day lasted for eight days. And from that day forward, the Jewish people uh, celebrated the miracle of Hanukkah, which uh, Josephus, Josephus, the historian, labeled it the Feast of Lights because it was a miracle that these lights lit for nine days and the temple was uh, again consecrated or rededicated back to the Lord and they were able to worship their God again. And so I tell you that story today because as we enter into this season of, of remembering Christ's birth, uh, they have commercialized it so, and it, it's not been so much a, a season of, of giving, but it's been more of a season of what am I going to get? Mm -hmm. And so I said it's a great time to think about the year. It comes to the close of the our calendar year. Uh, and so it's a, it's a time to reflect and look back and say, you know, I had some ups and some downs and things didn't go quite as planned, but it's a time to say, you know what, I'm rededicating myself to the Lord. As we think about the Jews rededicating the temple, God says, I don't any longer wish to worship in buildings, but I want to worship in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Lord. So I just want to encourage us today to rededicate yourself, my temple, where I have been unfaithful or where I may have desecrated my worship, my praise. I may have defiled. I may have not represented the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords as I should. So today, I want to rededicate my temple to the Lord. And maybe you, some of you, I, I know some of you have done everything perfectly. Uh, you had no mishaps the whole year. You had problems, but you were, remained faithful and steadfast. And I applaud you. God bless you. And I hope to be like you when I grow up. But some of us uh, slipped and slid along the way. Some of us got had some down days. Some of us got discouraged every once in a while. Some of us had some life just slap us in the face or turn around and kick us where the sun don't shine. You know what I mean? And uh, it wasn't pleasant. And I moaned and I grumbled and complained and said, in everything, give God thanks, mm -hmm. knowing this is the will of God concerning me. Wow. Let's look at Romans 12. Uh, I wanted to go uh, down to the eighth verse, Romans 12, beginning at the first verse. But, uh, you know, as I got through writing about the verses one and two, I said, wow, I'm on page four already. I can't make the font any smaller. So... <laughs> So we'll, we'll see. We'll probably just stop at verse 2. But I'll just read it in the hearing. And as I'm reading it, I want you to think about rededicating yourself, your temple, to the Lord. Romans 12, chapter 1, and it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually 
members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy to the proportion of our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he, uh, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. All right. So, again, as Dad would always say, whenever you see uh, therefore in the scripture, you have to ask what it's there for. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and I was uh, at a pastor's breakfast and they have an icebreaker and the icebreaker that day was to uh, say what our favorite book of the Bible was and to defend it. Why or why not? Well, uh, Romans wasn't the one I chose, but I said it would come in a close second or third. Um, because Romans does a great job of the Apostle Paul in chapters 1 through 11. He explains and he lays the foundation of the gospel. He's writing to those who are Christians, but he had never met them and he, he didn't uh, know exactly how they came to faith or who taught them. But he was making a claim that this is the, where we all stand. This is what Christianity is all about in verses or chapters 1 through 11. And then here in verse 12, he's saying, now, this is our response to this great gift of salvation. And so he said, therefore, now that you know what God has done, now that you know what God is expecting of us, he said, I beseech you that you would present your body a living sacrifice unto God. You see, in this New Testament, now Jesus made us all kings and priests. I noticed three of the songs in the worship mentioned kings, and, and two songs were talking about the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Yeah. Well, who are the kings that he is king over? Mm -hmm. Who are the lords that he is lording over? Mm -hmm. You and I now are the kings. We are the three kings of Orient. Wow. And, and wise men, kings still, worship the Savior Christ Jesus. Yeah. So God said, now that you are priests unto God, he said, see, in the Old Testament, only the priest could offer up a sacrifice. That's why the first king, Saul, got into trouble. He offered up a sacrifice, but he wasn't a priest. He was only a king. And so, but God said, I make you kings and priests. Yeah. So he said, now you're eligible to offer up a sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. But now Paul says something here very strange that they weren't used to or accustomed to. See, they were used to going out and to finding a perfect lamb, and they would, they would kill the lamb and, and offer the blood sacrifice on the altar to, to the Lord or the calf or the turtle dove or whatever it was. But he's saying, now I want you to do something different. God doesn't want that anymore. God wants a living sacrifice. Glory, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> God said, I don't, I don't want any dead sacrifice. I want you to present yourself. Your own body as a living sacrifice unto God. You know, I, I know some Christians who say, you know, I'll, I'll die for Christ. And I actually believe that because they don't want to live for Christ. Yeah. You know, in this world, as crazy as it is, it, it would seem to be easier just to die for Christ. Just to give up and surrender and die for Christ. That would seem easier because you go to heaven. You know, even the, that's what even the, the Muslims, uh, uh, they, they say, you know, he who is a martyr for Allah is guaranteed a spot in heaven. Otherwise, if you're not martyred for the sake of, of, of Islam, then your works have to, your good works have to outweigh your bad works. But I'm so glad I don't have to Amen. daily measure my good and my bad, but I can Amen. say that Jesus paid it all. Jesus oh, covered yeah. us. So it doesn't matter how long you've been lost in your sins. When you say yes to Jesus immediately, all of the good that Jesus did has paid for our sacrifice. So now we're a priest. And the sacrifice is to present ourselves yes. as living sacrifices. But some people don't seem to grasp that. When you give something to somebody, uh, it is no longer yours. Yes, 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 yes. 
You ever hear of an Indian giver? I know you're not allowed to say that anymore in this politically correct, <laughs> politically charged climate. But it used to be when I was a kid, there was an Indian giver. You know, you give something to somebody and the next week you want it back. Yeah. I'm taking that back. How can you take it back? It's not yours anymore. I have to give it back to you. Glory. And that's how many Christians live. I'm, I'm coming and I'm giving myself to Christ on Sunday morning. And then I'm going to leave here and do whatever I want with my body that I want to do. Wait, you just presented yourself as a living sacrifice to God. How's that song go? I'm not my own. What's it go? Anybody know? I give myself to you. I give myself. I give myself. Away. I, and sometimes I have to look up there and say, when I would see groups singing, like, I said, I wonder if they gave themselves away. Uh -huh. And then I have to look at someone and say, I wonder who they gave themselves to. Jesus. Jesus. Where were you Saturday night? Mm -hmm. Anyway, but we're giving ourselves to God. And, and in this time of rededication, I want you to think about when you say, God, I give myself to you. What does that mean? What do you think that means to God? If someone to say that to you, I'm giving myself to you, all I have, my abilities, my money. Wait, what? <laughs> Everything I'm giving to you, my time, my abilities, my, my wealth, my work. And so when we do that, then we are allowing God to do with our bodies yeah. as he pleases. Verse uh, number two says, uh, bodies of living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God gave his all. He gave Jesus Christ the greatest sacrifice in the universe of all time. He said, the least we can do. I may not have much. But all that I have, I give to you, our reasonable service. So verse 2, it says, so do not be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed. Now, the last couple of weeks, I've been taking you to science class. Today, I want to talk, take you to English class. I know you remember the verb to be. When you conjugate that, uh, it makes an active verb into a passive verb. See, if I conform, that means I'm doing something to something else. I'm conforming. I'm conforming. But, or I'm conforming myself. But it says, do not be conformed. That's passive. That's when somebody does something to you. When you put be in front of a verb, that's at something else acting on you. And he's saying, do not be conformed. In other words, he's saying, now that you presented your body to me a living sacrifice, don't allow anyone else to change that. Now we, we went over that quite extensively when I was in Bible school, and they would say, stop saying you made, they made me mad. They got me upset. You make me nervous. Don't give people that kind of power over your life. But even if you can get past that, then you... We think we live in this world, as I was saying, political correct world, world, where they have defined things. And we try to live by their definition of things. One of the words that they change the definition of is uh, tolerance. Tolerance used to mean I allow you to live. I don't necessarily agree with you. I don't necessarily like what you do as long as you don't bother me. I will allow you to do whatever you want to do over there, and you know what? That's on you. But now they've changed the word tolerance to me. You have to agree with what I'm doing and recognize what I do to be equal to what you do. The devil is a liar. And, and so there, there's other ways that the world is trying to conform you. Uh, uh, they say, you know, black people do this. Uh, we heard uh, the, the current guy in the White House said, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. Oh, wow. If you're black, you're supposed to vote for a certain way. You're supposed to act a certain way. The devil is a liar. Right. I've heard that said about Christians. Mm -hmm. I've, had, I've been at work and someone said, oh, 
You know, heard about John, he's saved. And they come to me and say, well, you're supposed to. I say, how are you going to tell me what I'm supposed to when your body has never darkened the doorway of a church? When you never cracked open a Bible? You never, never said a prayer? You never called on the name of God unless it was followed by a curse word? How are you going to tell me what I'm supposed to do? I've heard people say, if if you don't support abortion, you hate women. I've heard someone say, if you're black and black lives matter, then you're supposed to do this and that. But they don't seem to matter if you're black inside a woman's womb. Those lives don't seem to matter so much. See, the world is conforming us to its image. I've noticed something in the past couple of years. The news has changed. The news used to just report the news, but now they slant it, and it's so subtle, and they're constantly just twisting your mind, twisting the way you think. They say, uh, as the former president falsely stated, don't, don't put the falsely in. You're prejudicing. Just say what he said. Let us draw the conclusion. You just state the facts. Say what he said. Let us draw the conclusion. I notice a newscaster saying the news, and you know, the next person takes the news, and so sometimes they'll make a little comment, well this guy, this guy says, oh, my husband and I really like that. And then he goes on to report the news. See, this constant little dripping, drip, 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 conforms you to the ways of the world, and God is saying, be cautious, be awake. What is it saying in, in Ephesians chapter five? It says, see then that you walk circumspectly, yeah. circum like a circle, circle, circumspectly, looking all around you. Yeah. See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, yeah. but as wise, redeeming the time. What is redeeming the time? Buying back the time. Yeah. Yeah. You see, if you believe everything that comes along, everything that comes down the pipe, everything that everybody tells you, it sets you back from where? you're supposed to be or where you're headed. So here he's telling you, be not conformed. Don't allow the world to change you, to shift you, to get you off the mark to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, God says, first, what you got to do is present your body to me and then I'll change your mind. Yeah. You see, it's an inside job. God changes us from the inside out, but religion tries to change us from the outside in. You see, God says, I'm going to change the way you think. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And because I've changed the way you think, I'm going to change the way you talk. All of a sudden, I don't say it and speak the same way I used to because my mind has changed. I think differently. Hallelujah. You see, here in this passage, uh, there's a word they use for world, and that word is eon, A-I-O-N. We get the word eon from it. It's really not the world per se, as you think, but it's the world meaning the age. Don't let the age, the ways of this age persuade you. Yeah. What does that mean? What age is it? Who is the prince and the power of the world? Satan is the prince and the power of this world. He is the god of this world. And so he is the one that is setting how he wants the world to go. I tell you all the time, there are two plans for everybody's life, for every city, for every nation, for the whole planet. There are two plans. God has a plan. Both plans are laid out in John 10.10. 10. It says the thief, which is Satan, yeah. comes out but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. It blows my mind how so many walk right into the devil's plan. Yeah. I'll go for that. Yeah. I'll give you a little bit of wealth and a little bit of fame, a little bit of fortune. I'll make you feel real good for a few minutes before I throw you into an eternity of hell. Enemy desires to kill, to steal, and to destroy. 
But then Jesus gives his plan. He said, but I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. There's two phases to that. When you come to Jesus, he gives you life. That means eternal life. That's free. He said, but to get the abundant life, you have to stick around a little while. You have to get your mind changed. You see, religion tells you, you know, change your clothes. Wear nice things to church. You know, don't be seen in the bars. Don't be seen in the, 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 the gentleman's club. And, and you can act differently, but that doesn't change the heart. Religion doesn't work. It has a good start. It points you to God. But after you get to the real God, then it's all about relationship and not religion. Let God renew your mind. Be not transformed or conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of the mind. Do not be conformed to the, the, the spirit, the, 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 the will of the age, he's saying. Hebrews 6, verses 4 and 5. says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened to have tasted it, the heavenly gift and to become the partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Paul is talking about the age to come. When we come to God, he begins to show us his plan for our lives. He gives us a taste of what is coming. Ephesians talk about in Ephesians 1, he says, you know, get filled with the Holy Spirit because it is a down payment on what I have for you. It's just the beginning. Getting filled with the Holy Spirit, it opens the door to the supernatural for you. All of a sudden, what you weren't able to do in the natural, now you can do supernaturally. Because you've been empowered. You've awakened the God in you. So he said, I'm giving you a taste of the age to come to, to mess you up. Now I'm aware. Now I know what's coming. So it's just one thing uh, to, to, to be in the world seeking the pleasures of life, but it's a total different thing when God shows you, and, and all of a sudden he shows you what life is really ought to be like, and the real joy of the Lord. With the joys of the Lord doesn't come sorrow, doesn't come regret. So many have, have, have gone after the joys of the world, and they've been so sorry. I wish I had never done that. You hear reports all the time. These people will win these multi-million dollar lotteries. A few years later, they're in jail or dead. Why? Because they don't know. They don't know the goodness of the Lord. They don't have the mind of the Lord. God has allowed us to taste the powers of the next age, where Satan has no point, no part, to spoil us for the age, to spoil us from this age, and to long for the age to come. This age and the things of it will pass away. In Galatians 1, 3 through 4, it says, Grace unto you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. God has equipped us. I was witnessing to this young man on the street, and he said, I know everything you're telling me is true. I know it's right, but I just can't do it. I said, wow, you're in good company. I can't do it either. <laughs> Nobody could do it. If, he, if we could, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. I was telling you last week, uh, the Mormons believe if you c commit a heinous enough crime, the only way to be saved is to shed your own blood in your death. I said, that's ridiculous. Are you trying to tell me that Jesus' blood washes away some sins if they're, they're not so bad sins, but if they're really, really bad? They have to kill you, and you have to shed your blood in your death to pay for your sin. Are you saying that your shed blood is greater than the blood of Jesus Christ? 
Listen, if Jesus has already bled and died, we don't have to. He's already paid the penalty of our sins. He's delivered us. He's given us the ability to withstand in this age. The Apostle Paul writes to the Ephesians, I believe it's in the sixth chapter of Ephesians, and he says, and he writes to his brothers, and my beloved brothers, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He goes on to say, after you have done all you can do to stand, yes. stand. And then he goes on to tell you how to stand. He said, what you've got to do, you've got to gird up your loins with the belt of truth. You've got to put truth on you. You see, the devil is a liar and a father of lies. I often say, you know, the, the way the devil got deceived Eve was he mixed a whole lot of truth with just a little bit of a lie. If I were to offer you a bottle of water, no matter how thirsty you are, if I told you that it's 95% water and 5% arsenic, you probably wouldn't drink it. But however, we drink the devil's lies every day. You don't need to go to church. You don't need to follow. You're going to be saved right where you are. You heard the preacher say that you're in the temple of God anyway. Yes, you are. But we all need one another. Amen. We need to hear that someone else overcame what I'm struggling with today. Amen. You need to show up and tell your testimony if you're so strong. Amen. I've heard people say, oh, the church is not doing anything for me. But I can hear God saying, just like JFK said before he died, ask not what your country can do for you. See, it's all about me, me, me now. What can you do for me? What have you done for me lately? But God said, you've already presented yourself to me as a living sacrifice. It's not about you anymore. Now it's about me. He said, come unto me, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy. I will give you everything you need, but you've got to trust me. You've got to come to me. We're talking about how to rededicate ourselves back to life. To, to the Lord uh, by giving ourselves, presenting ourselves to, to God to transform us, transform us by the renewing of our mind. So many people revere the Bible so highly. It's not part of the Trinity. It's not Father, Son, and Blessed Holy Bible. Now listen, I'm not disparaging the Word of God. But people can take the word of God and twist it any kind of way they please. You heard Lucifer himself telling Jesus, doesn't the Bible say you can cast yourself off of a cliff and the angels will bear you up in your hand? There's a gospel now that preaches the, the absence of something. It, because it's not mentioned in a specific place, then it means it's okay. People are saying because Jesus never preached against homosexuals, homosexuality is okay. The Bible even says that John was the disciple that Jesus loved. That sounds like a twist, doesn't it? But what you've got to do, Jesus himself said, the letter, these words on a page, kill you. They will destroy you. They will put you in bondage. They will twist it to put you under the bondage of conforming to an age. But he said, we can't be, uh, uh, the letter killer, but the spirit of God makes alive. That's why we need to say, God, I want the truth. I want to gird my loins with truth. Yes. 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 I've got to start with truth. Because yes. if we build on a lie, everything else will crumble. Yes. So Paul said in Ephesians, gird your loins with truth. Who is truth? Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Yes. If Jesus can't be put in whatever knowledge you have, yes. it's not true. Amen. 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 In order for knowledge to be truthful, it has to have Jesus in it. Amen. Because yes. Jesus is the truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. 
And so then he goes on to say, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Be righteous. You see, our righteousness, the best that we can do, sorry, those that follow Islam, you can't do enough good to get to heaven. It's not possible. Not possible. So when he tells us to put on the breastplate of righteousness, your righteousness is as filthy rags. But Jesus Christ, he said, I made you my righteousness. It's only because of Jesus Christ that we can be made righteous. And Paul is saying, put on righteousness. Put it on as your breastplate so that it protects your heart. Put on truth that it, it, it protects your ability to reproduce. Our job as Christians is to reproduce, is to shine and to demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ so that somebody else will see the Christ in us and want to come. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. He said, have your feet shod with the preparation of peace. We yeah. talked a little bit about that last week. We, uh, 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 the Bible says of Jesus Christ, of his government and his peace, there will be no end. So since Jesus Christ came, his kingdom, his government has expanded. Yeah. It might be withdrawing a little bit in these United States, but I hear that there are 1,200 people getting saved I believe it's every hour, I could be wrong, it might be every day, in China. And they said, at this rate, China will be a Christian nation by 2050. Now, I'm no proponent, I'm no fan of China. China. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that was an inside joke, for that, in case you missed it. Um, but the kingdom of God is expanding. You see, after the, the, the Holy Ghost was poured out on the day of Pentecost, uh, there were 120 folks filled with the Holy Spirit yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. on earth. Mm -hmm. And that number has grown and grown, and, and then it, it drew, it waned back a little bit, and then it started growing again. And there was a time uh, in the 1800s in the United States uh, when uh, someone in Kansas City uh, they were telling about a man in Europe, Evan Roberts, who got filled with the Holy Ghost. And in this Bible college, he was talking, he was teaching the book of Acts. He had never experienced the Holy Spirit. And he's talking about Evan Roberts over in, in Wales and what God was doing through him in the Welsh revival. And one of the students in the class said, uh, Professor, don't, do you think the Holy Spirit will be poured out, is still being poured out today? He said, yeah, I just gave you a demonstration. Do you think the Holy Spirit will be poured out on us? Because they were reading the message of Apostle Paul, and he said, as it was spoken by the prophet Joel, he said, in the last days, I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. He said, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your children will prophesy. It's for you and it's for your children. And he said, yes, yes, oh yes, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. She said, do you know anyone personally filled with the Holy Spirit? The teacher said, sadly, no. And she said, how about we pray for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And the teacher got scared. He said, oh no, how about we pray for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit? So the girl said, okay. And the class gathered around. They prayed. She got filled with the Holy Spirit. She began to speak in tongues. Glory. And they were all alarmed and amazed. And, and she seemingly couldn't stop speaking in whatever language this was. So they told her to write it down, what she was speaking. So she was writing something down, and it just looked like scribble to someone. And they took that letter to someone else, and they said, oh, that's Mandarin Chinese. Not only could she speak Mandarin Chinese now because of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, but she could write it. And there was a black man by the name of William Seymour who, who heard about this. He said, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And he went to this Bible college with these God-fearing Bible believers in Kansas City, Missouri, at the turn of the century in 1900. And they said, sorry, you can't enroll, you're black. And he said, what? Nobody ever told me that. And, and he said, well, can, can you raise the window when you teach? I'll sit outside. I want this. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he learned all he could learn about the Holy Spirit. And he saw the experience of the Holy Spirit. But you know what? There was no further outpouring there in Kansas City at that time. Wonder why. And he took his message to Houston. He partnered up with a, a guy, I think his name was Pendergrass. And they went out to L.A. And he, 
In the meantime, William C. Wright got filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes. And out of him in Los Angeles, in Azusa, he began the Azusa revival through this one man who dared to believe God and dared to say to God, God, I dedicate, I rededicate myself. I want what's going on in Welsh, in the Welsh revival over there in Europe. If you're not a respecter of person, I can just imagine William Seymour crying out to God, saying just like the blind man by the side of the road, and everyone saying, hush up, you're the wrong color, you're the wrong gender, you're the wrong this, you broke, you ain't got nothing, you can't do anything, you don't even speak that well, just be quiet, let God do what he's going to do. He said, no, son of David, son of David, have mercy upon me. Son of David, son of David. God is saying, I'm looking for someone. I'll, I'll take anyone, anyone who will say yes to me, anyone that will turn aside and look to me. I, I, I don't know, maybe uh, some say that the, the, the children of Israel, their, 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 their freedom was delayed by a few days or a few weeks or a few months because Moses, the shepherd, he was going through the desert to, to take care of the sheep on the backside of the desert. And they say it was quite, quite common. It was so dry that sometimes the, the bulrushes would just burst into flame. But one day he saw some, a bush burning and he noticed it wasn't being consumed. So it says he turned aside to, to look and see. Because he made a motion. God is just looking. God said, I want, I'm willing. The clouds are pregnant with abundance of rain. Are you satisfied with what you have or do you want more? Because I'm looking for someone whose heart is perfect for me. Someone in whom I can show myself strong in the earth. And because Moses turned aside to see, God used him to bring a nation out of a nation. God wants us to put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, have our feet shot with the preparation of peace. But way down that list, he says, put on the helmet of salvation. And so many people teach, oh yeah, you got to put on that salvation because that's where it all begins. So well, why was that like number four or five on the list? And nobody can answer that. Why did he say a few verses for us and finally, my brother, wasn't he always talking, already talking to saved folks? Why is it he's now saying put on the helmet of salvation if they're already saved? Yeah. Jesus. Jesus. And it was quite some time before anyone could give me an answer. But I realized, I realized what he's talking about. He said, no, no, they were saved. When you get saved, if you're stripped, buck naked, you're still saved. Yeah. And you still have the power to beat the you know, the foot soldiers, the, the little demons. Yes. But you need on the whole armor of God to wrestle the principalities and the power, spiritual wickedness in high places. Yes. You need the helmet of salvation that acts as a lighthouse. It's the highest point in your body, and you become a lighthouse. So those that sit in darkness will see the light in you. Yes. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He said, now you become the light of the world. Yes. That helmet of salvation is not your salvation. It's so that you can draw others to salvation. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Put on that helmet of salvation. I didn't come to talk about the armor of God, but this is where we're going. And then he said, lift up high the shield of faith. Because you know what? As soon as you become a light, when you put a light on, I don't care if it's really dark, the slightest light will catch your attention. Is that a firefly? What was that? What was that up there? Oh, that's just a smoke detector. But it will catch your eye. And so when you become a light, you catch those who are lost. You catch their eye. They'll see you and they'll want what you have, but you also catch the enemies. Somebody said new levels, new devils. You dare to be stronger in the Lord. You have to fight bigger enemies. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared, as they say, because now you're equipped to take them on. Everybody wants the, 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 the Goliath size reward, but they don't want to fight any giants. You have to make up your mind like Queen Esther. If I live or die, I'm going. I'm going to see the king. I'm going to get what he has for me because he is the only one who can change my situation. Electing a new politician. Uh, having some governmental policy 
policy or program is not going to fix me. But what can fix me is Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. So I put on the helmet of salvation. I lift up the shield of faith because now the enemy is shooting at me. And that faith will quench the fiery darts of the enemy. He said, but don't stop there. We don't just want to be a punching bag for the enemy. He said, I've also equipped you with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. God says, get the word in you. But wait a minute. Didn't you say that the Bible is... Is the letter killeth, but the spirit make the lie? The letter does kill, but you now have the Holy Spirit working on the inside of you, and it makes it alive, and it becomes a powerful, two-edged sword. Hallelujah. You can declare the word of the Lord. I heard somebody say in Sunday school, if the enemy came up to rob you, came in the church with a, a machine gun, what would you say? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? I said, oh, man, I wish I was in that Sunday school class because I, I can tell them something. When I heard a click, click, and a gun piece of metal pressed to the back of my head, and they said, give me all your money. And I looked at him like he's crazy. I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord, because I know what was inside of me was greater than what was inside of him. He said, I ain't playing, old man. And that's when I got mad. <laughs> I said, we're going to bust out here with some kung fu fighting. And I said again, I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, it was like all of a sudden, because this is the third time I've been held up like that. And this is the third time the holder upper failed. Uh, but before, the, the time previous to that, when I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, they all ran. They all, like fear fell on them, they all ran. Yes. This time, this guy didn't run. Uh -huh. But his pants that were already halfway down went all the way down. <laughs> his nose began to run, and he couldn't, didn't know whether to wipe his nose, pull up his pants, or point the gun at me. So he's trying to run, holding his pants up. And me, like an idiot, chasing him down the street with an ice scraper. Until I realized, what am I doing chasing this knucklehead with a gun? Anyway. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah, the spirit of confusion fell on him that time. See, God doesn't always work the same way. I was expecting fear, but confusion showed up. I said, God, that works too. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So we have the word of God. Let's hide the word of God in our hearts. Amen. Wow, yes, I don't yes. even know where I am in the message anymore. Galatians starts by talking about deliverance from the evil age and the times. Then it ends by talking about deliverance from the evil world, the wickedness of people. You see this world at the end of Galatians, in Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Here that word world is Cosmos. Cosmos means the world or the planet and its inhabitants. So there's an age, an evil age, that's trying to conform us to it. There's a spiritual element that's trying to conform us to its desire, its plan. But there's also the people who are under the influence of the age who are also pressing you. And he say, I am crucified. I'm dead to you. Jesse Duplantis tells a funny story. He said he was in Las Vegas, and, and he was standing in a hotel, and his wife was in the ladies' room, and he was just waiting for her, and this lady comes up to him, and he said, sir, let me show you a good time. And he said, oh, no, I'm dead. She said, that's okay. We can have fun in other ways. He said, no, you don't understand. <laughs> he said, not only am I dead to Christ, but if my wife comes out of the ladies' room and sees me, I'm going to be dead again. <laughs> But Christ can give you to the ability to withstand temptation. Yes. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, we can't be delivered from this world if we're not delivered from the age. If we, we get deliverance from the age, the, 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 the pressure, uh, and I, I, I've said this a lot lately, uh, there's a lot of books written by great uh, men and women of God, far, far greater than, than I. But they, they have these books, and they're entitled The Battlefield of the Mind. And it talks about how 
So many are raging war in the mind. And I say uh, we have to get the war out of our mind That's right. by getting the word full of our mind. You see, if you're full of God, yes. Yes. is there room for anything else? Jesus. Jesus. To be filled with the spirit. Fill, fill yourself up, consume, give us this day our daily bread. Come to God daily and receive the, 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 the revelations from heaven. Wow. Uh, not conform to the same, but transformed by the renewing of our mind. Transformation begins in the mind. God works from the inside out. We, we already said that. Religion works from the outside in. God changes your thoughts, your words, your intentions. Religion changes your dress, your actions, your locations. You must first present your body, then God will work on your mind. Yes. Yes. Mm. Amen. Yeah, well, let's just go ahead and read it. That you may find out what God's will is. When you know God's will, you'll have a vision. The Word of God says that uh, without a vision, man without a vision casts off restraints. Mm. Uh, my dad would often uh, teach because he's read a lot of Miles Monroe books that it if you don't know your purpose, you'll misuse an item. If you don't know the purpose of an item, you will misuse that item. Yeah, yeah. I, I, my dad was a, a tinkerer mechanic. He could, you know, instead of paying to get his car fixed, he would stay there and get it fixed. And it would often, it's amazing, he would get these cars fixed and it was great. Uh, and he accumulated a lot of tools, but he wasn't as great about putting away his tools. So sometimes he'd be working on a car and couldn't find the tool that he needed. So he'd run into the kitchen, he'll grab a butter knife and he'll you know, use it as a wedge or a screwdriver or whatever it was, or a steak knife, and he'll cut whatever he needed to cut. And because he didn't realize the purpose of a steak knife, it's not to cut electrical wires, it's not to use as a screwdriver. When you went to cut the steak, it couldn't even cut through whipped cream because <laughs> We didn't use it for its correct purpose. And so many are living their lives that way. They're trying to go this way, but God is saying, no, I need you to go that way. And they can't figure out why things are going so wrong in my life. I went to the right school. I paid the right people money. I voted for the right person. Why is my not life not going the way I want it to go? God says, try my way. Present your body as a living sacrifice. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. But I dare you, if you're pressed into my right hand, you'll know the pleasures of life. He said, I've not only come to give you life, but I come to give you abundant life in every way, shape, or form. I want you to be prosperous in body, soul, and spirit. Hallelujah. That's abundant life. That's true riches. Whenever you need something, God provides it. Whenever you need it. Not to have mountains of gold in your living room. That's not rich wealth. Amen. Wealth is having what you need when you need it. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. I, didn't need it. I know some people say, I need $5 million. Well, what do you need it for? Uh, uh, just give it and I'll let you know then. Uh, well, you don't need it if you don't know what you're going to do with it. Jesus. I'll buy me a new car. Well, how much does the car costs? I don't know of any cars that cost $5 million. There yeah. may be some. Well, I'll buy a new house. You're going to buy a $5 million house? No. What do you need $5 million? You don't need the money. You need the house. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some time ago, I had this great, this amazing revelation. It just blew my mind, and I uh, attempted to even write a little book about it. You may have heard of it, the God's Ultimate Plan for Man. It's an awesome book. You should yes. get it. Um, I'm not doing a commercial here. Uh, but at the end of verse 2, it says, let me go back and read it so I can get it right. Verse 2 says, and we're almost done. Give me three and a half minutes. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. One day I'm reading that, I said, wow, there's three wills of God? It says that you might prove that good, that acceptable, and that perfect will of God. What in the world is he talking about? I've read that verse many times for years and years and just kind of skimmed over that. We've got to prove the, the good, perfect, acceptable will of God. I thought that was describing all three, describing one will. But then I'm, I'm thinking about it and praying about it, and then I thought about good. Whoever heard the word good in the Bible before? When we all stand before the judge of the earth, we who are believers and believe in God, he, we expect him to say something to us. And he says, well done, the good, 
and faithful servant. That's what we all expect to hear. That's, that, I believe that's going to be the lowest common denominator. No matter how much you've done, the very least, the very worst that he's going to say about you when you get to heaven is, well done. That's a pretty good report. Thy good and faithful servant. So it said, wow. So to be a servant of God, that's good. John 1, chapter 11 says, He came to his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become. As many as received him, received him. When you receive Christ, you can't function as a son by receiving Christ. Though you're born a son, oh, they're playing me off. Uh, <laughs> When you receive Christ, you have the ability that opens the door to sonship. Yes. So when the disciples came to, to Jesus, they were his bond servants. So after three years of walking with Jesus, Jesus said, I call you no more servants, but I call you my friends. That's still good. But now, now he's saying, uh, now that you've come to me, uh, I will give you the power to become the sons of God. Galatians chapter 4, he said, though we're born sons, we're treated like servants. And we're put under tutors and governors until the day appointed of the Father. You have to have some training. That's why my message always is the mature sons of God. And so when you become a mature son in the Jewish tradition, when the, the son has been the, uh, received the approval of his father, he would take him into the sound, sound, town square and say, this is my son. He's not just a boy that I gave birth to, but he, now he's my son. He takes ownership. He is acceptable to me. He is recognized to me. And that's what God the Father did to Jesus when he was baptized. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He is the acceptable son. God says, I want you to be servants. I want you to be my friends. That's good. But I want you to become an acceptable son. Uh, but he didn't stop there. Yes, yes, yes. He said, I want you to prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is the perfect will of God? What can be better than being a son of God? Jesus. Read my quote to find out. Jesus. No, uh, <laughs> Jesus now has gone back to heaven. And Jesus declared just before he went, he said, Upon this rock, I build my church, my ecclesia. And then if you read throughout the epistles of Apostle Paul, he talks about the ecclesia as being the bride of Christ. Yes. And then you can read in the book of Revelation, he said he's coming back for his wife. Yes. Jesus wants to marry you. Yes. I know it might be hard for some of you women to be a son of God, but it's going to be even harder than for a man to be a bride. Mm -hmm. I uh, we'll let God work that out. But he said, I'm looking for a bride without spot or wrinkles. Yeah. See, it's the spots and wrinkles that are the imperfection. But he said, I'm looking for a bride without those things. Mm -hmm. The psalm says, predicts way back in Psalms 138, I believe it's about verse 8. He said, I will perfect that which concerneth you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ephesians says, I've given you gifts to the church, apostles, prophets, uh, pastors, evangelists, teachers for the perfecting of the saints. God wants to bring us into perfection. The next, we're, we're coming out of the period of grace. We're stepping into the period of kingdom, which is the kingdom or the, the dispensation of perfection. We will walk in perfection. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Apostle Paul also writes on another occasion, he said, let's leave the principles, the foundations, the elementary things of the gospel and go on to perfection. Yes, yes, Hallelujah. Yes. I guess you get the point. God says, I want you to prove that which is good, that which is acceptable, and what is the perfect will of God. I want you to get to perfection. Yes, yes, yes. When you don't need the tutors and the governors, the tutors and the governors are the apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and, and, and the other one, pastors. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right. My time has been up like 40 minutes ago. During this week of Hanukkah, let's rededicate our bodies and our minds and be determined to God. I don't want to settle for good. Good is good. God, I don't even want to settle for better than good. 
But God, I want to be perfect. I want to enter into perfection. There's not many examples of perfection around us. But God, I'm not looking to them. I'm not trying to be like anybody else. I'm not trying to be Benny Hinn. I'm not trying to be T.D. Jakes. I want perfection. I want to be like Jesus. It says, when that revelation comes, now are we the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. What shall we be? We shall be perfect. We shall be the bride of Christ. For when we see him, we'll see him as he is, and we'll be just like him. at home. If you've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart, there's no need trying to rededicate yourself. You need to dedicate yourself to the gospel. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by presenting your body a living sacrifice and let God transform your mind. All you have to do is ask him to come into your heart right now. Say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of all of my sins. And now, now that you've received him, you're eligible, eligible to become the Son of God. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. Don't stop there. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ask God to fill you with His Holy Spirit and ask Him to give you the gift of speaking in other tongues. I say, I don't know about all that. I know other people, I know you can go to heaven without all that. But I'm not talking about being good. I'm not talking about being acceptable. But you're going to need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues to be in the perfect will of God. Uh, yes. Praise the Lord. This is the day of deliverance. And deliverance is taking the land. See, I was right. I didn't get to the other verses. Shalom. Until the next time. God bless you.